Welcome to Season 2, Episode 7 of the Ubuntu UK Podcast. It's Monday the 22nd of June 2009 and in this episode we're going to talk about what's coming up in the next release of Ubuntu. We're going to interview Jim Killick, the director of the Open Rights Group. We've got the news and events. Simon is going to wow us with his segment. We're going to talk about the competition and the ecosphere and then we'll have your feedback. With me this evening is Simon. Evening. How are you mate? I'm really, really tired. I've had a busy week this week. Oh man, is it going to be lazy cast nah. again? Snore cast? I've been working my backside off. Um, I haven't really had time for Ubuntu, actually. <gasps> uh, I know, it's terrible. Kick him off, right. If well, you'd like to write in, if you'd like to replace Simon. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like, I have. I've been working hard. Um, and actually, it's made me think a lot about my, um, Life? my feelings about free as in beer. I've been working uh, on Biobu. Oh yeah, yeah. And, you know, I've, I haven't really had time for it. Oh, you'll be doing the documentation. Yeah. yeah. yeah but that happens, though. People, people move in and out, and they wander in and out, and do stuff when they have time. Yeah, but if somebody was paying me, <laughs> then I might, I would have to make the effort. This right is your call for a job. No, 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 no. But what I'm saying is that I now appreciate why people should get okay. paid. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, Dave, you're with us as well. Hello! Wow, he's on microphone and larger than life. What have you been up to the last couple of weeks? Oh, I've been working on some top secret stuff that I'm afraid yeah. I'm not at liberty to say in this episode. Well, is that, that gets you out of yeah, it's saying what you're doing the last couple. <laughs> just say that every week. You've just forgotten I know, to I make was your list, that. haven't you? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> and Al, I know, has a massive list. <laughs> what's actually, what's actually on your I, list? I did last week and then I d- ended up not saying any of it. So, yeah, I'll... I'll what, uh, yeah. Is I'm, there a highlight? Well, there's a couple. One is um, I've been playing a bit with VirtualBox. Oh, and, right. Um, and uh, one of the things I did, I, I've i mistakenly in the past when I set up a VirtualBox, I made a virtual disk too small. <gasps> you, know the, you know they yeah. can expand yeah. on demand. Well, I set the maximum size to be something like 20 gig or something like that. And when I was playing with iTunes last week inside Windows, I was downloading podcasts and I filled it up. So wow. I had to expand the disc, and it's not as straightforward as you'd imagine. But I used an Ubuntu Live CD oh, right. and G-Parted, mm-hmm. and it has a funky way of expanding discs, and it G- all worked. G-Parted is really quite handy. It's really cool. I've used it inside virtual machines on many an occasion to fix a, a full file system and stuff. Yeah. Um, and my thing is that I've just about finished moving to my new server at home. Um, I got a Tranquil PC. You, s- you have a system. server at home. How quaint. Yes. Well, I have servers on the internet and in the cloud as well. Um, but I have a server at home because I don't trust anybody else with my data. <laughs> and uh, I, I, it was an old desktop system, a tower system, and uh, just replaced it with a bare bones, a bare bones thing, which is I don't know, about the size of a shoebox with five hard disks in it. For the benefit of our listeners, uh, Tony is actually gesturizing with his hands to I show am, us how big it is. I am gesturizing. Can, can we actually include some pictures of that on, for the release? Along with a description of gesturizing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's really cool. It's it's dead quiet. There's a, there's a fan in the back, but it is pretty it's pretty pretty quiet and uh, it's a lot cooler. It doesn't put out anywhere near as much heat as the uh, as the old server. Are you going to have as many issues as Al did with his home? Server? Oh no, because this isn't a proprietary thing like a Drobo. Oh, it it okay. just, just runs Linux. Oh, You're not going to cool. accidentally delete all your data like I <laughs> Well, there's no guarantees of that one. (laughs) Right, let's get on with the show. I thought given um, we've got a few months now until um, Karmic 9.10 comes out, it might be nice to introduce a few things that are coming up so people can look forward to them or indeed test them out, try them out on um, the alphas and betas of, uh, Mm. of Karmic. So I've noted, I think, three or four uh, this week and hopefully we'll have more uh, as the weeks go on. Okay, the first thing seems to be uh, rsync-based dev downloads, which seek to reduce the amount of time spent downloading new new binaries. Uh, this is similar to the RPM deltas. That yeah, the thing Fedora. Fedora Fedora has. Yeah. Okay, um, which we've said about, and yeah, it was a good feature actually. Mm. Yeah, I remember talking to Paul Sladen about that about three years ago uh, at Fosdem. Fosdem yeah, yeah. yeah. Over okay, a beer. So the difference is that it, as I'm just reading here, it actually doesn't download the whole package. It downloads changes. Yeah. Because yeah. at the moment, if you make a change in one open office file, say, um, that uh, in a particular package, there might be 100 megabytes. You're downloading the whole 100 megabytes and one thing changed yeah. for sure. one security I, fix or whatever I had it might the be. thing when a slight translation changed. Okay. So you got the yeah. whole lot again. Yeah. Over 100 meg just because of that. Whereas this would only have the one file that's changed and a couple of bits of metadata, presumably. Very cool. Yeah. 
Uh, there's a plan to port the USB creator, which you may have seen in um, Jaunty uh, and previous releases, is a is a nice little tool that lets you take an ISO image and um, put that onto a USB stick and make a bootable USB stick. And there's a plan to port that to Windows. Ooh, you can already get U Net boot in for Windows. Can't you, you can, yes. So this is different. How? It's not the same program. Okay. <laughs> but also, uh, USB creator is for Ubuntu, isn't it? And you netboot yeah. is every is it, distribution. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah. It's something in my head that said, uh, there, oh, yeah, that was it. I was trying to think what was different. There was um, a uh, discussion at one of the recent UDSs where we talked about um, further activities to add into the USB creator, like being able to add packages as you do it. So you could say, okay. take an ISO image and say, put that onto the USB stick and take away OpenOffice or add Banshee or you know remove something or add something as you do it. So some combination of the USB creator and Synaptic. Add remove. Yeah, and add the add remove, remove yeah, thing, yeah. yeah. So is that build your own distro on the fly? Yeah, kind of. Mm, it's dot com. Mm. Um, Karmic is going to ship with Grub version 2. So what? Well, I it's mean, grubby. that's a very Grub- good question. Yeah, but actually, Grub version 2, that's been in the works for years, and I thought it was one of them, like, vaporware things that was never going to come out, and I was actually really surprised to hear about this. So what does it bring? What does it bring to the party? I heard Duke Nukem Forever uses it. <laughs> Is it does it support more um, boot options, like being able to boot off of LVM and, and quirky oh. boot and different file systems and stuff? Oh, that might be handy. I, I, did, I followed that. We've got a link, and I'll post it in the in the show notes um matt zimmerman posted um about it and um, i followed his guide just this afternoon actually and it works if it's newer it's got to be better yeah it's a higher number so it must be better (laughs) (laughs) i suppose yeah okay um and the final thing is the replacement of pigeon the instant messaging client with empathy a Mm -hmm. different instant that's quite major isn't it yeah Um, given uh, pigeon has always been in ubuntu as game previously mm. and now pigeon well, I mean, you know, the sole reason for this for me is the fact that Empathy actually supports webcam. Mm. I mean, you know, I mean, Pigeon refused to add webcam support. People want that in a mm. messenger. And there was the whole fork about free pigeons or whatever it was. Oh, no, it was about being pigeon. able to expand the message yeah. window in a certain way. It was more about accepting community contribution, really. Wasn't it? But an Empathy uses the telepathy framework, doesn't yes. it? Which, if you've been to things like Log Radio Live, you may have seen the guys at Calabra talk about. So mm-hmm. when I install Karmic and drop in my um, pigeon folder out of my home folder, is Empathy going to pick it up? Uh, it does question. migrate, yes. Cool. Ooh. It migrates accounts from pigeon to Empathy. And I, I, I tried this some time ago actually and it worked fairly well um, there are some gotchas there are some things that Pigeon has that Empathy doesn't yet and there are some uh, you know, is, that, is that keeping your messenger accounts passwords in plain text because they, they, they need to implement that it's that's not just Pigeon. that it's some um, secure communication as well that kind of you know stuff is missing email in with your favourite things that are coming up in Ubuntu 910 podcast at ubuntu-uk.org or hit us on Twitter or Identica <laughs> We're here with Jim Killock from the Open Rights Group. And Jim, you're the uh, director, is that correct? Executive director. Executive director. Um, now, you took over from Becky Hogg, who we interviewed way back in our first ever episode of this podcast, back in Season 1, Episode 1. Wow. So, um, how did you come to be executive director of the Open Rights Group? Well, I applied for a job, and I got it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm good short of it. Excellent. So, what was your sort of career and background before that, then? Well, I, I was working for the Green Party... Uh, for a number of years and I was doing a lot of work in communications and before that I was working uh, for a small company doing sort of graphic design, web design, that sort of thing. So I'd got a technological interest and I'd got a sort of political communication interest and uh, I've sort of found that digital rights was one of the really big emerging issues that had sort of struck me over a number of years as as being very important um, because you know, information it's it's how we run our society having society's interests uh, you know really at heart in the way that we construct a sort of new information society seems to be very important but not necessarily very well understood um, and we see this issue these sort of issues coming out either in things like digital rights management or copyright or privacy issues and each time it seems it's really important that the citizens voices uh, properly heard, but not always. I don't feel it's always understood by politicians who are perhaps 
fixed a little bit more on sort of more headline issues, if you like, in, mm. in the press. Yeah. Rather than the sort of longer distance strategic issues. It's a massive area, Jim. I mean, do you focus on uh, specific topics, specific areas of, um, of digital rights, or do you cover pretty much anything that you feel is important? Well, Open Rights Group has to focus on, on things that it can get done at any one time. And if you try to spread yourself across dozens of campaigns or whatever comes, you know, becomes important this week, then very quickly you end up getting absolutely nothing done. So we do concentrate on a few key issues at any one time. So for the last sort of year or two, we've been running campaigns about uh, form, for one thing, uh, sort of privacy issues involved in interception. Um, and behavioural advertising, uh, then also sound copyright, the issues involved in, in taking a large chunk of the commons out of the hands of the public um, in sound recordings, the issues of locking up that material and the sort of financial consequences to the public as well. Um, mm. Those have been the, perhaps the two biggest things that have done over the last uh, year or so, but also we have big campaigns on privacy to do with... Uh, you know, to privacy issues to do with the government, the sort of plans the government's got for interception um, and uh, data retention. A couple of years ago, we were also running a lot of uh, campaigning on e-voting, uh, which we very successfully persuaded politicians that actually black box technologies for voting systems weren't transparent and weren't necessarily a good idea for democracy. We do seem to have got that across, but uh, of course people are still trying to sell these systems, so they, mm -hmm. they come back. So, you you mentioned you've been successful in the past in in some of these campaigns. Do you do you have the the ear of the government or um, uh, enough uh, influential people in government and in well both in the UK and in Europe to be able to um, influence them? Do they do they actually uh, see you as a you know credible group? Yeah, I think I think that we are seen as credible and we do get listened to by some people. I mean, some people get the internet, some people get the digital era, some people don't. Some people see the digital era as something that they've got to represent businesses' um, interests within. Um, so, you know, we're one of many voices, but we're one of the very few consumer, if you like, that's the way we like to see it. So I don't think we all think of ourselves as consumers these days, more as users and producers um, than, than purely passive people. Mm. But, uh, Nevertheless, if you like citizens' voices, Org is one of the very few organisations that really does that well. And obviously, Consumer Focus and some of the more conventional groups get involved in these issues as well. Um, but as a sort of pure user constituency uh, campaigning, uh, you know, we're, we're more or less, the, well, we're the only one in the UK, we're one of a handful in Europe that really get that message across. So yes, we do get listened to. And even, even in the very obnoxious sort of proposals you see in Digital Britain, I think it's clear that voices like Org and it was Org has had has made the uh, government's responses uh, to sort of copyright infringement at least on some level take some of the concerns uh, that we'd like to see taken up. You know, they are there. You know, they they are not doing everything um, by a long chalk. I'm sure we'll come on to all that later, but you can see the influence of having a group like us in that debate. That's great. What what would you see was the most onerous part of the the digital Britain or um, the strategy that the government currently have? Well, I, I mean, from our point of view, the thing that we're most concerned about this is where we're coming from, what we're uh, sort of campaigning on, is is the issues around restrictions of of people's internet connections if they're accused but not convicted of uh, copyright infringement. Oh, the kind of three strikes and you're out. Well, it's, this is sort of three strikes and you'll be throttled. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> this is this is a dopey, a dopey light is what I'm calling it. You know, it's, it's, it's not chucking people off the internet, but it is making your connection not work properly. It is potentially port blocking. It's all kinds of things which could affect third-party businesses, uh, could certainly affect your user experience, um, and all of this without actually having been... Uh, convicted of anything so it's guilt without with guilt upon accusation if you like mm. um not actually throwing people off but it is sort of you know, good chunk degrading of the service completely and you know that then you know you still have to ask well 
how far are these sort of tactics going to go? You know, is the government going to try these sort of tactics on other sorts of technologies they don't like or other sorts of practices they don't like? Well, it is very strange that the the government are looking at ways of, with things like form of, of well, maybe not the government, but organisations are looking at ways of interfering with data that's coming in and out of your homes and businesses, but they don't intercept your mail or, you know, parcels that come into your business, but they feel that because it's digital, somehow they have the right to look at it. How... How do you convince them that that's that there's a, a disparity between those two? Well, you know, our existing laws ought to do it. I mean, this is this is a peculiar thing. I mean, uh, Ripper says that you're not meant to intercept communications without consent of both parties, without you know, you know, good reason. So, our existing laws ought to tell them that that they've already decided this. That you know, our internet connections are basically like the post, and although there are certain things which might be done by ISPs in order to make sure that, uh, you know, your internet connection is functioning okay. Mm. Um, in most circumstances, you shouldn't interfere with people's data. You know, that, that isn't something that should happen. Um, again, with, with this sort of thing that's happening with uh, Digital Britain, they've, they've sort of worked out, again, that they shouldn't really do too much snooping if they can help it. <laughs> but you look a little bit further, and they are looking, they are saying that, you know, if we, if we can't get the letter writing to work, then we do want to start examining the contents of people's traffic as it passes through the network. Um, you know, so, you know, they, they, they're not, they haven't really worked out the principles, I think, is, is the basic thing. And it's technology, and technology does two things for politicians sometimes. Firstly, it baffles them, and secondly, they think, woo, new things, let's see what can happen, let's do all these new things. You know, without sort of sitting back and thinking about the, the actual consequences, they just think they can you know, must all be different, whereas actually, in some ways, the world isn't so different. You know, the, the principles of, of what's right and wrong don't really change. Mm. Oh, yes. Uh, one, one thing that interests me, Jim, um, how do you actually... Um, so so you, you get an issue that you want to follow up. What process do you actually follow as part of your lobbying? Um, so do you, are you writing to people? I mean, how, how do you actually do that? Well, a lot of it is, is basically meeting people, so we have to actually make appointments for people go and tell them what's going on part of it is writing responses and making those public um, and part of it is getting the public to interact with the people who they're voting for so we do it on as many levels as we can you know, as, as much contact with MPs decision makers civil servants at whatever level is is, is needed and, and that's how lobbying works for us a bit different perhaps from a uh, company or uh, a, a sort of uh, traditional lobbyist, if you like, from the point of view that we're trying to represent the public's opinion. So it's very important that the public get involved in that debate and demonstrate that it isn't just some hobby horse type people <laughs> sitting in an office who think they know what's right and wrong. You know, we have to, we have to, as a community and a, a, as citizens, show that these are wider interests that are appreciated by a lot of people. But, uh, and, and without turning into a sort of party political broadcast, are there um, some parties who are more receptive than others, or does it vary between individuals within a, within a party? Well, I think I mean clearly there are there are some very definite uh, cases. Of, you know, there are some good people in every party. It's not um, strictly you know one party is better than others. What I would say is that the larger parties tend to be worse than the smaller ones. I think that's, that's the, the real, real bottom line that you can see. The, the, big, the, the bigger parties that tend to be expecting to be part of government also think that uh, they have to represent industry's uh, interests and, and they're very close to industry and industry spends a lot of time, you know, commercial lobbyists spend a lot of time working to make sure their opinions are properly represented and well represented within those parties. But because they're the big parties, is that essentially they're victims of their own success because they're bigger, it's more difficult to get the message across because there are more people, or more members of parliament or whatever within a given party? It's, 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 I think personally, I, I mean, this is purely a personal view, I think that the larger parties are prone to think that they can get away with uh, basically representing commercial interests more. Um, and they also have a bit more of an eye on, you know, they, they tend to assume that they're really there to negotiate between government and industry, and the public are a poor third. 
whereas smaller parties tend to actually want to get votes and popularity rather than sitting on pile of votes and being essentially the only choice that you've got. I mean, the Conservatives think, you know, they are, from their point of view, the people who are going to replace Labour. And if you really want to get rid mm. of Labour, you're going to vote Tory. And similarly, if you're the Labour Party, you vote Labour because you want to keep the Tories out. So they don't, they actually have less interest in, bizarrely, or whether the bigger, more popular <laughs> parties, they have less interest in listening to the public in some strange sort of way. <laughs> it's all about the middle of the road, I guess. Yeah, and, and you know, they're, they're, you, they're, they're also lobbied to death. So between those sort of two factors, uh, they're not very responsive, whereas the smaller parties are looking for the avenues in. They're looking for the ways of saying, well, politics has got to change, and, but, you know, the people are not being properly represented. So the Liberal Democrats, the Green Party... Um, even UKIP, um, you know, these, these are parties who tend to be more responsive on, on digital rights issues, although you would not necessarily expect that. Yeah, that is quite surprising. Uh, Jim, um, just to summarise, what are your current really big things that you're actually following at the moment? Well, I've mentioned form. Uh, that, you know, I mean, not less a company in, in some ways, but the technology can be on some levels quite disturbing. The principle of interception... Um, is what we're trying to concentrate on with with, uh, ad- with behavioural advertising. Um, so that that's that's one really big thing. The second thing, uh, the sound copyright debate and term extension in in, in uh, recorded works. We're still keeping a close eye on that. Um, we're expecting that debate to be sort of postponed for around six months while Sweden holds the European presidency. But it will come back, and it's you know we've got to work to try and get something something changed in that to make, at least make it better than it currently is um, or, or, or just simply get it kicked out you know, we'll, just, we'll see what happens there um, then we're also going to be working on copyright limitations and exceptions trying to get copyright reforms to be more uh, in touch with the digital age things like format shifting uh, uh, exception for parody and so on, these, these are things we'll be working on too um, and then the the big things like um, the the changes in, uh, in in interception that the government's able to do, we're also going to be working on that. Um, you know, we've, we've all you know you've heard about the intercept modernisation program, and I think that's going to be something that's going to get very controversial over the next few months. And, and hopefully, the government will get a bloody nose over it. <laughs> really deserve it. So if. Um, I- if people want to know more, I, I guess the first port of call is obviously your website, openrightsgroup.org. But also, um, obviously, you have, you're financed um, by a, a contribution. Um, and I noticed there's a, a little thing on your website showing a little, you know, thermometer contribution thing. How, how important are those contributions and, and how can people contribute? Well, those contributions are utterly vital. I mean, they're completely how we fund ourselves as an organisation. Um, as you'll see, around a thousand supporters are paying about five pounds a month uh, to keep us going. That employs two uh, two uh, full-time members of staff at the moment, keeps the website running, all of those sorts of things. Um, and uh, that's how we work. You know, that by having those full-time members of staff, we're able to get into government meetings. We're able to make those appointments and talk to people, and also get the campaigns running. So. That, that's really, really vital. That's the first thing to do. Then the, there are plenty of other things to do. Um, getting onto our org action email list, um, ha- following us on Twitter or Facebook, and then sort of from those avenues, sort of you know you can hear about like, what needs to be lobbied on. You know whether you need to, something to write to an MP on in, in, in that week or that day, um, and then. Plenty of other sort of volunteer activities that we do. Actually, there's uh, you know, again there's plenty of techie stuff that we do, but we also uh, look, you know, have a wiki which gets, you know, needs lots of maintenance and news blogs that we run and plenty of other things where volunteers are basically adding huge amounts of activity to the open rights group. So there's plenty, to, plenty to do. We definitely need money off people, but we also need people to help us out with real tasks too. Okay. Well, um, thank you for coming on the show. We really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah. Um, we'll post a link to openrightsgroup.org and, um, yeah, encourage everyone. Let's just 
Everyone in this room, are we all contributing? I, I'm a contributor. I am. I'm signed up as a contributor. <laughs> uh, hang on, yeah, Dave. I guess, I guess the rest of us should actually get on and do this. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really worthwhile organisation. Laura's got her hand in the air as well. So there's three of us, out of five, three of us are currently supporting OIG. Um, so yeah, I think, it's a, I think it's a really important organisation. And thank you for coming and talking to us this evening. Thanks, Thanks again. Thank you. Cheers, Jim. Cheers. Bye now. Goodbye. Grok Law have released an article quoting a computer manufacturer vice president saying that uh, they are afraid of Microsoft and claiming that Microsoft are suppressing Linux on their books. Mm. Mm. Depressing. Yeah, kind of sad, but, you know, expected. It's what we thought was going on anyway, isn't it, really? <laughs> yeah, it's just confirmed it, really. I wonder what the manufacturer is. Uh, it's Taipei. actually... The, Taipei. No, it's Taipei Consortium Taipei. of Manufacturers. It's not just one manufacturer. Oh, even worse. Sun have released a VirtualBox 3.0 Beta 1, which supports multiple CPU and experimental DirectX 8 and version 9 support for guests. Yeah, so finally gaming in a virtual machine. Is it quick enough? Well, probably not yet. It's, right. you know, it's, it's only, as it says, experimental, and it's a beta. So it's so no. 3, is, 3D it, screensavers. Yeah, but is this exciting? Well, it's for, you know, we've always said to people, you know, use wine or use a virtual machine or something, and now actually it's becoming a possibility. Multiple CPUs, use support's more useful for debugging multi-threaded applications and things, I guess. I don't know. I mean, in some ways, isn't this a step backwards because you still have to run a separate operating system? Yeah, it sucks because you still got to have a license for evil stuff, but, you know. World of VirtualBox? Yeah, well done. Sorry, sorry. Oracle. Songbird version 1.2 has been released. Among the new features is a graphic equaliser, which was miss- missing from Rhythmbox, at last FM radio playback, and a two way sync with iTunes. If you're using iTunes Music Store to purchase content, you can now automatically expose iTunes library tracks and playlists into Songbird. You can also export tracks and playlists added to Songbird back into iTunes so that they can easily be synced to your iPhone or iPod Touch. That's cool. If Very it, cool. Does it work? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Sounds cool. Um, I'm going to ask the question. Just answer yes or no. Does Songbird use mono? No. Microsoft has set up a competition with a ten thousand Australian dollar prize for people who run Internet Explorer eight. Not a bribe or anything. The campaign website claims that IE eight is more secure and has more features than Firefox and Google Chrome. It's and part, part of their Get the FUD tour, isn't it? Yes, and you have to run IE eight. It tells you. It gives you a message when you go to the website in any other browser saying you won't find the prize with that old browser. Something like that. Maybe it uses some flaw in IE8 to download a Trojan, which then takes you <laughs> to the right site. <laughs> Everyone's favourite Unix vendor, SCO, have had an 11th hour reprieve from bankruptcy, with all the uh, business assets and IP from SCO going to new company Unixes. No, can't read that. I think it's Unxis. Really? Or, yeah. It's a stupid name for a stupid company. <laughs> Memory vendor Kingston has announced a 128 gigabyte USB memory stick at 546 US dollars. That's about 333 pounds in our currency. However, you only see 32 and 64 gigabyte versions on the shelves. The 128 gigabyte version is only available by special order. That's monstrous, isn't it? Yeah, and that's enough to run a whole computer and still have all your files and you know, yeah. whole mobile you could have operating a whole, system. You could have a whole mirror of the Ubuntu repository on a stick. I mean, that's where we're going, isn't it, really? A computer on a stick. You get to somebody's hardware, plug it in and crack on. <laughs> it's really? a computer yeah. on a stick. Yeah, we are. I've got a 16 gig and there's just loads of room on there. PC in your pocket. Amazon have released all 137 megabytes of the source code for the Kindle, their ebook reader. Ooh. Yeah, it's not clear if the DRM stuff is in there, though. I started to download it and then realised it was 137 megabytes and stopped. <laughs> <laughs> Whilst they've released the source code, can we actually do anything with it? You read it. It's, yeah, but can yeah. you do anything with it? Well, I mean, if you were, a, if you were an uh, e-book manufacturer, you might want to look at things like the, the e-ink drivers and that kind of stuff and how, how it interacts with e-video and, and I'm stuff. not clear what license it's released. Yeah, that's what I mean. I mean, can we get in there and reflash the Kindle with our changed You can code? do what you like with the code yourself, but you just... I'm not sure what the re- redistribution terms are. Linux has beaten other operating systems in the race to support the new USB 3.0 standard. Due to enter the kernel soon, support for USB 3.0 is already available as a backport in Debian and Ubuntu. 
Yay. Yeah. So when will we get computers that can use that? <laughs> yeah, that's some way off. It was a bit of a chicken and egg situation. <laughs> that's, though, that's, it, really? that's less certain. <laughs> Ubuntu Karmic, that's uh, 9.10 if you number lovers. Alpha 2 is out, based on kernel 2.6.30, and GNOME 2.27.1. Thanks for the number, guys. It also includes fixes for the slow performance of Intel graphics chips and uses EXT4 by default. Yeah, and Grub 2 as well. And apparently Grub 2 is so much faster that there seems to be a current bug of saying that if you're booting from SSD, it can take up to five minutes to get past Grub. Nice. According to a recent report by Digitimes, Microsoft is telling netbook vendors that it will charge between $45 and $55 for Windows 7 Starter, compared to between $25 and $35 for XP Home, the version that accounts for about 90% of the current netbook operating systems on the market. If Microsoft uses the budge, some netbook vendors may decide to continue selling Intel Atom N270 and N280 based netbooks with XP instead of version 7. According to the Digitimes report, does, does that mean a lot to you guys? Well, it's interesting that they're pricing it more than Windows XP. You'd think they'd mm. be very competitive on that price point. And also, it's been reported that Microsoft are putting pressure on netbook manufacturers to not make uh, netbooks larger than a certain size. Yeah, to cap their specification. Yeah. yeah, they've already put pressure on MSI to stop manufacturing or to stop distributing a machine that has both SSD and a hard drive because that's not part of Microsoft's spec of what a netbook is. Gotta love the freedom, haven't you? Mm. ZMP have developed a Linux-based robot car for testing safety devices. One-tenth the size of a real car, it has a 500MHz AMD Geode CPU, two cameras as eyes, and costs a cool $7,000. Where do I buy one? It's cute. It's really cute. It's got... Effectively got a Viglin inside. (laughs) Yeah, I was going to say. That's kind of frightening. (laughs) Where do I buy one? Follow the link. Arcos have announced a netbook with 500 gig hard disk running Ubuntu and 2 gig of RAM. The Ubuntu version has more RAM and storage than the Windows version and retails about 25 euros more. Quite substantially more. It's got like double the RAM, I think, and three times the storage than the Windows version. Yeah. So it's pretty good value. It's a nice looking machine, actually. It's uh, currently only available in France. Uh, Archos are the people that make the, uh, the media. media players. Yeah, they've got those really nice 5 inch and 7 inch media things. They're really nice. So this is, you know, if it works in France and they're going to maybe sell them elsewhere. Uh, there's an Irish Ubuntu uh, Loco Summer Bug Jam on the 27th of June um, from 12 o'clock till 6 in the evening at Laura's place. Uh, that's not our Laura. That's uh, Laura... Yeah. <laughs> nice one. <laughs> Laura Kajowki. It's Tchaikovsky. Uh, well done. Why didn't you do that one? I deliberately left you to do that one. Thanks, Actually, I wanted mate. Dave to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, have a poke in the eye. UK Unix user group OpenTech on the 4th of July in London. What's that about? No idea. Follow the link. OpenTech? EuroPython 2009 is running from the 28th of June to the 4th of July at the Conservatoire in Birmingham, United Kingdom. I didn't do a Birmingham accent this time. <laughs> no, but you did get to say Conservatoire. conservatoire. Um, I was in Birmingham a couple of weeks ago and I found a sign for the Conservatoire. Yeah, I know. You, you sent it to me at MMS. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for that. It was a long train journey back. Um, more details at europython.eu. Open Source Schools Unconference at NCSL's Conference Centre in Nottingham is on Monday the 10th of July. 20th. 20th of July. Monday, what did I say? 10th. Okay, off by one. Uh, it's Software Freedom Day. Uh, this year is on uh, Saturday the 19th of September. Atlanta Linux Fest, also the 19th of September this year, at the IBM facility on Northside Parkway. Where's that? Uh, in Atlanta. Oh. Atlanta, Georgia. Actually, um, Nick Alley from the other podcast uh, asked me to mention that. And um, they've redone the website and it all looks very good. And they've got some good speakers and uh, all the details are on the website. We'll put a link up. Good luck, Nick. Ubuntu Global Jam, 2nd to the 4th of October, 2009. What's that about? It's like um, we had a bug jam earlier in the year, didn't we? You went to two. Two two of them, yeah. Um, But this one is not specifically a bug jam. This is um, everything. Every, every kind of contribution. Bugs. Yep. It, it's not a special sort of thing where everybody brings their own ingredients to make a big giant tub of jam. It's not a women's institute. No, no. Okay. It's it's a. Uh, we'll talk more about it in a segment in a later be, episode. There should be really Ubuntu jams. Ubuntu Cola. There should but be Ubuntu jams. It's, it's unaffiliated. If you could, if you're going to have jam, you'd have the yellow would be what yeah, lemon curd. Mm-hmm. The red would be strawberry jam. Yep. What would the brown be? <laughs> Nutella. <laughs> oh. Chocolate. Yeah, chocolate jam. Chocolate jam. 
That's like a Chris Morris sketch. And finally, Lug Radio Live 2009 is on the 24th of October at the New Hampton Arts Centre in good old Wolverhampton. Yay. We'll be there. <laughs> Stop, <laughs> you stopped recording. <laughs> Awesome. There, there's a 10 second uh, thought to, to thought to voice yeah. box. We oh, yeah, noticed. Should we crack on with the ecosphere? Yep. We're back with the Gerald this week, and um, what? Well, Alan's <laughs> looking at me. Uh, well, I just spoke to the guys from Linux Outlaws, and they thought it was called Harold. Oh, so maybe maybe we should well, go because G last it's, time, it's, H this it's time. It's open to interpretation. Yeah. Well, it's one in the ICU anyway. It's what that, you want it to be. It's the Ubuntu ecosphere. A little 1066 and, joke there. <laughs> and I'm editing it all very good, yeah. <laughs> okay, so whatever we're going to call it this week, um, what's in the ecosphere? Drama. Yes, drama with uh, the satanic edition of Ubuntu, which, as many people know, is a themed thing for Ubuntu. And mm. there was a bit of a shock and awe that um, it got shut down, or the store got shut down yeah the, the online store where you could buy t-shirts and stuff i think wasn't it yeah yeah and um jono piped up on the um on their blog post and detailed how he would try and sort it out and did pretty quickly and he actually gave us uh sent us an email to clear it up um, figuring we might include this in our, our roundup <laughs> man it's a big one so this is what uh jono said in terms of ubuntu satanic edition i've checked into it and it was an error they should never have got the mail from Cafe Press. The Canonical Trademarks team will be sending them a trademark license that they can preserve, sorry, present if there are any further issues. This should resolve that specific case. He goes on to say, Trademarks are a complex topic and Canonical needs to balance a fine line between providing fair access to the community and ensuring the trademarks are protected for everyone. If they're not protected, we lose them. And that will be a bad case of the groans for everyone involved. <laughs> Okay. Uh, the trademark policy is remarkably flexible, and I'm keen that we don't limit it. I love how our community uses it throughout the diverse range of things they do. Instead, I'm keen to have a clear list of those stores selling content that meets the generous terms of the trademark policy and to ensure we explicitly grant them a license. This will then stop the confusion that happened with the Ubuntu satanic debacle. To do this, when a store meets those needs, we'll send them a confirmation email that will have a license, which will be free. We'll then give uh, put a note of that store on the wiki page, which will give the trademarks team a useful tool to know who is acting responsibly. Now, I did look at the wiki page a couple of days ago, it's and blank, there was nothing it? on it, <laughs> so they're all going to get taken down. Yeah. But I think the assumption was from the Ubuntu Satanic Edition people was that they had been taken it down because it was the Satanic Edition, yeah. and you know, perhaps people were not comfortable with that, and it's associated uh, associating with the Ubuntu brand. But as anybody who's met Jono knows, he's into all the uh, the heavy <laughs> metal. And, well, I'm not saying he's a Satanist, but he, he's into the uh, the hard the hard metal and all that sort of stuff. And he does the funny thing with his fingers that look like horns. Um, so I, I, he was obviously keen to see it restored. That apparently, to makes you a Satanist, <laughs> according to Tony. It's all the same. To I me, mean, yes. it's it's not a serious Black distribution, is it? It's it's made, meant to be a parody. Well, it's a serious it is distribution, a parody. Well, but it's not about Satanism. Yeah, I mean, it's, right. it's a parody. Okay. It's a parody know, of the Christian parody. edition, and I guess the Christian yeah. edition, if they have a shop didn't get taken down mm. but it was all a big mistake and it's all fine now and it's all sorted let's move on everybody's happy on the Ubuntu UK uh, loco mailing list uh, David King tells us about Titan Lev an Ubuntu derivative which seeks to look and act like Windows yeah uh -huh. yeah <laughs> how could this be <laughs> What's he done to get it to look at? Like well, Windows? no, David King hasn't. He's, oh, he was okay. pointing out um, a link to this other ah, company okay. that are making something that looks oh, yeah. remarkably like that. Windows. I remember looking at that. It's not just Windows, actually. They, they've made a little application where you can click to make it look like Mac as well. Oh, oh I might be interested in that. <laughs> <laughs> because oh, yeah, Ubuntu doesn't look enough like a Mac already. <laughs> well. Now, that's an interesting uh, trademark use, actually, of how they've used the Ubuntu logo. Is it? Yeah, go and have a look at the website. Very interesting. Oh, it's the horrible uh, four, sort of, four sort of mashed, yeah. Rectangular, vaguely, uh, rectangular version of the Ubuntu. The round logo. Yeah. yeah, it's got four things, four people instead of three people, so it's right. kind of squarish. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it seems a bit rough around the edges so far, but I actually think what they're doing is, is quite a good idea, actually. I mean, some of the stuff they've written in-house clearly needs refinement, mm. but, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure it's a bad idea. I'm sure there's a market out there for people who want a stable platform mm. that looks like Windows and runs well. Is it all open source? That's as yet to be okay. ascertained. Fair enough. The Ubuntu Technical Board has clarified the position of Mono in Ubuntu. Colin Watson reiterated that Mono debacle 
somewhat ties into the patent policy direction we have been given by Mark Shuttleworth, indicating that we will act on a cease and desist notices, but not on rumours. Colin also confirmed that we generally take in the attitude that we will ship the best available applications, assuming we can do so within our licensing guidelines. Yeah, this comes up after all the mailing list threads on the development mailing lists and loads of blog posts about people saying we should get rid of Mono, get rid of F-Spot, get rid of Tomboy, we should replace Tomboy with Gino. No, we should replace uh, Rhythmbox with Banji. No, we can't do that because that's Mono, etc. So we should read into that. Mono's not going anywhere anytime soon in Ubuntu, I don't think. Doesn't look like it, no. There's always other distros. The joy <laughs> of freedom. Yeah. And I get, seriously, get that's lost. It's about Nana. And as a wise man once said, no hard feelings and enjoy the rest of the internet. <laughs> Yes, I'll take the credit for that. Um, the GNOME Pilot package, which provides support for Palmos devices, has been removed from the Ubuntu default install. Is this in 9.10? Uh, actually, it, I'm not sure whether it's going to go back in or out, because it's... This seems to be a bit of a ding-dong going drop on. Drop it, well, drop it! I knew you'd like that. That's why I included this, because I know Dave hates the fact that there's support for Palm devices in, in Ubuntu by default. But the problem is it's quite closely tied with evolution and the conduits and all that kind of stuff, so... It's actually not as straightforward to just yank out the known pilot. It's only 36k or something and stupid as well. If that. people have still got devices that use it, then... Yeah, I have. Yeah. You know, leave it in. Mike Basinger, everyone's favourite forums admin and... Uh, American. Community Council and Utah resident. Mm-hmm. Um, let us know that you can now use OpenID to identify on the Ubuntu forums. Excellent. So you can log in with your Launchpad account if you've got one. Yeah, you can't. You have to link it to an account on the forum as well. Oh, yeah. so it's not totally seamless yet. No, but you can authenticate. So once you're all set up, one you only, it's just one. Yeah, one thing. Or certificate if you're that clever. Right, there are some interesting plans um, going on for uh, for the next release. Um, they're looking at actually producing a slideshow to, to be displayed during the Ubuntu installer. You know, like in Windows, like when you get there. <sighs> Oh, like oh, in can Windows. We, can we have some stock art where you've got people looking really happy and excited? Those little stick men from PowerPoint, those little things, yeah. Oh, no, the, the stick men from XKCD. Uh, mm, yeah. So what's it going to show? Is it showing random pictures or things related to No, it's Ubuntu, um, like or? telling you things like, you know, Ubuntu is secure and you can get oh, your okay. email and, you know, it's just basic, simple marketing while you're installing. Which but surely got... you're already hooked by the time you're installed. Yeah, so you're... we can expect plugs of landscape and Ubuntu One, maybe? <laughs> Possibly. Simon sits in the corner and asks, why? Yeah. Well, but the Sorry thing is, that. that's 10 minutes of your life where you... I mean, we could even have free e-books there where people could actually, you know, read, read a novel while you're installed. What <laughs> novel could you read in 10 minutes? <laughs> Apart from C-Spot Run. <laughs> Don't diss it. <laughs> You have until the 26th of June to file bugs for Karmic as part of the 100 Paper Cuts initiative. Examples of paper cuts include a bug, um, make the home folder name more consistent in GNOME because in some places it's called home, others it's called home folder. Hmm. Um, another bug, disable workspace switches on mouse scroll. That's really annoying. That's the compass thing, you know, when you nudge the mouse wheel and it just goes, woo. <laughs> oh yeah it switches you to thing the is, thing is when you actually get used to it you can actually use it when you want it yeah you, you learn to avoid doing it i've seen new users what, the mouse? touch the mouse pad and go whoa what happened <laughs> where'd everything go and another one reduced number of pre-installed screensavers who here actually selects a screensaver yeah blank that's yeah. the one i select yeah i mean do you actually select that isn't that yeah i cool? actually sit there and go through all the screensavers every single one and then we go right back to the top and choose blank so <laughs> what exactly are paper cuts then well, paper cuts are trivially fixable usability bugs that the average user would encounter during his or her first day of using a vanilla Ubuntu 9.10. I filed one the other day. Did you? Yeah, really? Yes. Network manager, if you've never, if you've got a blank install and you try and connect to a wireless network, and you know sometimes connecting to wireless is a bit fraught and it doesn't work sometimes, um, you click on your access point and maybe it does or doesn't work. But if it doesn't work... Uh, and then you right click on network manager and you go to the edit connections to try and tweak the settings it gives you the name of the access point and then it says never next to it and that's supposed to mean you've never connected to that access point oh but it actually looks like i will never connect so to it's that a last point. connected column but yes, unless you pick but there's no heading on it oh right okay so yeah is there not one also to add the word ubuntu to the system dictionary yes <laughs> 
quite like that. Yeah, and, and Laura's had a bug that's been picked up as a paper cut as well, which is oh, something really? to do with usability on the system janitor um, uh, process, by the way it reports and tells you which packages it wants to remove. So we'll see if that one goes anywhere. That's the old craft removal tool, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, that's the one, yeah. And apparently the first 10 paper cuts are to be fixed by next Friday. That's this Friday. This Friday. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent at the time of speaking. Linus lists his top five features of the new 2.6.30 kernel, which will be used by Ubuntu 9.10. In at five is a new entry, caching from the network file systems. Secure at four is integrity management by DAS kernel. Holding at three, we have the file system drivers with X4 tuning. That just leaves the top two, and beaten into second place, it's storage improvements by per performance and... Oh, by performance and stability. That's appalling. And in the number one spot this week goes to the long-time favourites of the show boot with boot faster you enjoyed yeah. writing that didn't you i did i had a little chuckle now if we're gonna get the rights to led zeppelin we'll put it underneath <laughs> <laughs> matt garrett has taken apart the leaked palm pre root file system image that's been floating around and he appears to be impressed by what he sees which was quite nice to read yes he's poked around the panels also little bits of firmware and things in there yeah and the dmca tools. copyright stuff the drm <laughs> engine and all sorts of things nice. there, i think yeah don't understand most of it but yeah the important thing is it runs linux and it uses upstart yes in a piece for really linux a walter v koenig this why he believes people think Ubuntu sucks and seeks to blow away some of the myths. Yeah, it kind of, um, the title makes you think, what? Because it says Ubuntu sucks, but it's actually why he thinks other people think Ubuntu sucks, not why he thinks Ubuntu sucks. It's things like um, people blogging that things that they could do in Windows they can't do in Ubuntu, and whether that's you know, a case of them needing to learn a new technique or whether it's actually the fault they can't just pick it up and do it. Mm. Friend of the show, Andy Stanford Clark, hosted BBC's Rory Celepid. Plan <laughs> Jones. <laughs> Apologies. I mean, has anyone got any better suggestions on Kefler. this? Kefler. Oh, okay. Apologies. To talk about his Twitter-enabled house. The most exciting thing to happen in the Isle of Wight since Queen Victoria died. <laughs> so does that go flush of the toilet and it tweets? And then it tweets. Yeah. yeah. How many pounds of material? Is it electric- electricity stuff that he's... It's, it's how, much, how much electricity the house is using, whether the mouse traps in the roof space have gone off. And, um, How can it possibly know? The mouse traps have got sensors in. <laughs> oh, is this the, the photo that he had of his massive wiring? Yeah, and a yeah. Viglin? He used a Viglin MPC to yeah. replace a hundred different devices, and, and it sends out all these tweets and, and things when stuff happens around his house. This this, this guy Andy also uh, controls um, the the ferry for crossing to Isle of Wight. Uh, well, he doesn't, he doesn't control the ferry. No, no. He, he has the service that tells people when tweets when the ferry gets into port yeah, or and he also does it for uk trains as well i think or something i don't think so isn't it oh. i'm getting shaking heads oh shaking heads. so that oh, okay. it means no and that's all we've got in the herald this week gerald <laughs> don't you start <laughs> one of the websites we've mentioned recently is um what's it called command line foo command line foo that simon seems to like quite a bit yes yeah, um, we thought we'd get you to pick out one of your favourite command line foos, and tell us about it. Well, I think I'm going to try and make this a, a bit of a regular seg, actually, um, to bring on the people who are used to Ubuntu's GUI and uh, maybe a bit frightened by the command line, because it is incredibly powerful. I was that person. All of us have been that person. Mm. Um, I remember actually sitting at Hans Lug with a USB stick that wouldn't mount and having the uh, the local nerds try <gasps> their it's alright it's not on the lug anymore so it doesn't matter um, <laughs> try their hardest <laughs> I don't mean anything personal try their hardest to get my USB stick to mount and it didn't but I saw all this fancy you know command line stuff going on and it is incredibly powerful so I thought we could um, put one out per episode mm-hmm. um, we're going to put them on the website because as Alan will tell you reading out um, command line stuff um onto the podcast can get really quite hard quite dry yeah Yeah. so the first one is really cool one of the hardest things i've found is to try and find out about uh, system information and um and read it easily so this first one is about listing your hardware so the command goes like this ls hw space minus html so basically that is going to list all your hardware in an html form and then you get it to um, 
get lshw to write it to a web page so you use the greater than um is it a redirect what the hell do you call that yeah, it's redir well, redirect. redirect. Yeah. It's a redirect. And then you just give it a, a web page name, in this case, hardware.html. So essentially, it scans through your system, lists all the hardware, writes it to an HTML. And then you could just open that in Firefox or something? Yep. Or you could upload it somewhere. and Or you can do anything with it, really. I mean, you can do this remotely. You can do loads of stuff with it. Cool. So there's the first one. Drop it in. Have a play. Hmm. It'd be great to get some feedback, actually. And if people have any suggestions for uh, cool command line, single one line things that we may or may not read out if they're very, very long yeah. and have obscure characters in them, then, uh, yeah, let Simon know and he'll figure out the best Simon, ones. Simon's the man. Podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. We set a competition in the last episode. Yep. What was it to win? It was one of them Viglins, the little computers. The MPC-L. L for Linux. Um, L for is, love. <laughs> love the MPC. And this is what Andy Stanford Clark was using to twit his house. Oh, no, you did a throwback there, didn't you? I did, yeah. Really yeah. Impressive. Well yeah. So these things have got a 400 megahertz AMD Geo CPU, half a gig of RAM, and an 80 gig hard disk. And uh, the ones that we've got here runs Zubuntu. And there's a mouse and a keyboard with it as well. And it's just £79, including VAT and postage. I have to say for the competition... It doesn't include a mouse and a keyboard. Okay. Because that makes the bog is, a it, box it, insanely it large. It did, okay. but I reckon someone's had it away. No, actually, it came in a tiny <laughs> box. I didn't get a keyboard and a, and a, and a mouse so and a you, USB user stick. must have own USB mouse and USB keyboard Yes, in this case. But if you pay the 79 quid, you get one. Yeah. Um, if you want to take up the special offer, it is still running. You can email mpc at viglan.co.uk and, um, and get, get it hands for 79 on quid. 79 quid. Um, but we did have one to give away, as Alan said. Um, we set a question. What was the question, Simon? The question was, the Viglan MPCL has approximately the same footprint as A, a matchbox. B, a CD case. C, a DVD case. Or D, Roger Bannister in 1954. And the correct answer was... Well, before was, you go oh, there, I think we should go through some of our incorrect answers. Oh, oh okay. We're going to embarrass some people now. Well, no. Don't mention yeah. those. No. Just yeah. read them out. Okay, go on. What have we got? Um, we, had, we had one answer where it said, I found your latest competition somewhat confusing. What is difficult? What, to, what is the difference between a DVD and CD case? Are you talking about the jacket they come in or the actual DVD or CD drive? Anyhow, I assume you're talking about a DVD drive or maybe the DVD case are a different size in the UK. Anyhow, I picked the answer C, the DVD case drive. The actual dimensions are, and he actually states the width, <laughs> depth and height of the actual unit. Yeah. Well, yeah, a DVD case is bigger than a CD case, just as a, you know, example. Well, if, you go uh, a, yeah. if you go to PC World and you buy a bit of software on a CD, it will Never. often come in a DVD dual case. But are you talking about the mass, the volume, or, me, or even how oh, hang on. places? I don't care. Yeah, yeah. neither do I. Excuse me whilst I sleep. We did, we did offer a not very subtle hint earlier in the competition segment last episode that gave you the right answer. So if you missed that, Actually, yeah, I did wonder why you said that <laughs> when we were doing that segment and you went, a Viglin, which is the size of a CD case. I dropped, yeah, it was much more subtle than that. No, it, it wasn't. It was. <laughs> well, we did also have another entry from someone and he says, hi guys, I believe that the footprint of the Viglin MPC-L. <laughs> and he doesn't Excellent. actually say, finish his sentence. So. Oh, bless. Oh, bless. He obviously got very excited. <laughs> must enter must the enter. competition. Deadline is approaching. Although we never have worked out the time zone implications for the competition deadline, have we? Shh. <laughs> Don't go there. Don't go there. So come on, who won? Yeah, put us out of our misery. Adrian Ray. Congratulations, Adrian. And it'll be winging its way to you just as soon as Alan gets to the post office. Within the next six months. Guaranteed. Yeah. JD Hartland emailed about the saved tab Firefox extension we mentioned a couple of episodes ago, and he says, just to let you know, Firefox already has the ability to reopen a tab you have just closed. If you hit Control shift t you can just keep hitting it over and over to restore the tab you've just closed, not the last one. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, I forgot about that. I use it in um, Chrome, same key pressing. Chrome. Oh, right, okay. So yeah. you don't need that extension after all? Nope. Okay. Bill emailed in to tell us the low OG feed links to the high OG files. Yeah, that was my fault. I'm sorry. I don't know what happened there. All of fixed. them. Well, no. Well, maybe. Some of them. Some of them. And you also managed to break the website for On, a, oh, a substantial God. portion of the last week as well. People did notice. Well, we were upgrading to WordPress. We? Something. 
two point eight or something like that. What? Don't bring me to this? I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> I said we because I thought if I said you I, you'd get upset that I wasn't involving you see, in the process. See, in the process if, of breaking see, the website. If the process went absolutely fine, it would have been I. But because it broke, <laughs> it's the we. we must all no, take... I meant we as in you fixed it. I broke it. You fixed it. Oh, that's fair. It's teamwork. Andrew left a comment on the blog uh, saying that uh, he's an artist on the Breathe icon set and basically they've taken the base oxygen icon set and are making it human. Uh, Not only the colours but also the feel of the icons. The default ones in Ubuntu, human icons, were made by Ubuntu and the tangerine icons, optional but installed by default, are the tango icons but orange. So tangerine and orange, nicely confusing there. (laughs) Ian Pascoe emailed us with a mini rant about LTSP. You made a reference to LTSP in episode 5 and seemed to imply that the netbooks being relatively cheap for bulk orders, there was no real need for LTSP in the developed world. Following LTSP, as I do, I can see why your perception may include these two statements. However, netbooks have been embraced by the LTSP networks as a cheap, thin client alternative where old equipment has to be replaced. That said, a standard box and monitor setup still seems to be the main preference. I, I, I'm not sure we did imply that it was um, there was no need for it. It was yeah. more... yes, actually. Tony said those exact words. I was think I was reading from an article, wasn't I? The news article. It was the it was the Edge Ubuntu project who was yeah. saying we need to review our priorities mm. given the impact of netbooks. Yep. Whether LTSP is something we should be concentrating our efforts on. Um, I'm not sure. I may have agreed with it. I don't know. But, you know, it, it, LTSP is a good project. It's worth continuing, obviously, for some areas. It's just, you know, is it as important as it was? It's a question. The Ian in Australia, the Ian, the one, of, one and only, sent us his, this plea. He, he just wants to say he's very disappointed that the convicts over there in Australia, <laughs> his words, uh, are missing out on the competitions. We're even letting those prudish Americans enter. Surely the boss, brackets Mark, is good for some postage and handling. Well, it might be. Um, it's not like Australia is in space or anything. Um, w- would, would that Mark was fit of, uh, footing all of our postage bills um, for all the the, uh, the prizes, but sadly we have to come out of our own pocket. Yes. Um, I've never actually investigated shipping anything to Australia. Um, no, we just figured it was like so, so far, far away. away. We couldn't get it to the other side of our own continent, never mind the other side of the world. <laughs> um, maybe it's really easy, actually. Because they're quite civilised down there, aren't they? Probably got a good postal service. I'm saying nothing. <laughs> where, where, so, I've offended enough people. So, so what you're saying is in the gone. rest of the world we don't post to isn't rather developed. In terms of postal service. I keep digging. <laughs> Josh Holland uh, emailed us a link saying that after we announced the release of Lives version 0.9999999, that 0.9 recurring is mathematically equal to 1. Oh, so they've already made their 1.0 release without realising <laughs> yes. it. Congratulations, Lives. Ed Hewitt uh, asks us for our opinions on Lubuntu, a new variant um, based on LXDE. Um, XFC and LXDE are both very similar in memory and CPU, u- CPU usage. However, uh, Zubuntu uh, has been made fairly heavy due to Ubuntu's involvement improving its usability. This is not a bad thing. It has made Zubuntu an excellent alternative from brown and orange. (laughs) Uh, Although I believe the same thing will happen uh, with Lubuntu. Probably. Um, I believe it will be fair... uh, Sorry, I believe it will be far better if Ubuntu used their resources on improving the speed and memory usage of Zubuntu. That is a criticism I've heard a few times. People are saying, you know, it used to be that you use zubuntu on lightweight you know low spec machines yeah and now people tend to say you know lxd or crunchbang crunchbang yeah yeah and i i'd like to see them do more work on xfc and getting it really sort of slick Lean. so that it runs mm. on just about anything not that i want to stop people using something else but it seems like another another variant is just you're oppressing me i'm not oppressing you i can't reach Martin Meredith says he didn't mean to sound angry last time round when pointing out the differences between unchangeable and invariant. He emailed us in the last episode. Didn't mm. he? he actually states, as a Debian application manager, it's kind of important that I know the difference between the two words. Sounds I'm meant to be teaching people what it's about after all. P.S. I like the name Gerald. Good man. Excellent. And Martin's got a column in the latest Linux format magazine, I noticed. Ah. A sort of a technical how-to article. So, well done, Martin. 
And finally, Peter emailed us to say that Medway District Council's webpage for reporting abandoned cars uh, fails to work not only in Firefox, um, but also in Opera, Netscape, and IE7, rather remarkably. Mm, good so, luck re- recovering your car in the Medway District. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And that about brings us to the end of the show, chaps. Yep, thank you for listening, and thank you to everyone who took part via Twitter and Identica. If you'd like to get a hold of us, you can email the show via podcast at ubuntu-uk.org or leave 30 seconds of voicemail on 0845 508 1986. You can send us your comments on Identica via identity.ca slash UEPC or Twitter, which is twitter.com slash UEPC, as well as getting updates from recording sessions. Alternatively, if you're into IRC, you can chat to us via the hash Ubuntu-UK channel on the Freenode IRC network. Join the 130 people on our Facebook fan page. Search for, search for Ubuntu UK Podcast 130. That's wow. We welcome your suggestions, material, tips, reviews, rants and feedback, both positive and negative. Uh, although if it's negative, please be quite nice. Um, so please do get in touch. Thanks also to our network of community mirrors listed on the website. That's all for this time. We'll see you in two weeks. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.